tell you how stat and microscopy work. Okay. Uh, stat is mostly kind of stimulated emission depletion, but we don't care what that means. So make it simple. Uh, as I mentioned, if I focus a laser beam, the spot of the beam on the sample will be diffraction limited. Right now with the best optics about 250 nanometer. Then I use these 200 nanometer uh, spot to scan my sample. I would get an image, but the image is not going to be better than 250 nanometer resolution. And in 2004, that's the year I arrived uh, at UBC, I noticed this paper. Okay. There was this theory explain how to create, instead of this spot, it create a donut on the sample. I focus a laser beam, but the focal spot is not a spot, it's a donut. Okay. I read this paper in 2004, uh, but when I arrived, I really don't have much to do. <laughs> and I told one of my postdocs, how about this some calculation, if this work this is gonna be useful. And he did the calculation, it really, according to what they described, we can really create a donut. Okay. This is the idea. If I overlap these two beams, Robert told me to paint it color, but I forgot, but sorry. Say, this is my excitation, and it's gonna give me fluorescence, but the spot is too big, bigger than I want. But I'm overlapping these two do the donut beam on top of it. The, the, the function of the donut is really to get rid of the fluorescence from the outer part of the spot. So if I can deplete the fluorescence using the donut, and then my effective fluorescence spot will be smaller, then I use this small beam to scan my sample I would get a resolution that nobody had ever seen. Right? That was the idea. So the whole point of stat microscopy is to make my scanning laser spot small. Okay. Yes, we created this donut. It took us half a year to create that. Okay. It's not trivial. Uh, but we did it. So the idea is I overlap them, the spot will be smaller. If I increase the intensity of the donut, the higher the intensity of the donut is, the smaller my force and spot will be will become. Okay. So I need a powerful beam. Okay. To increase my resolution or decrease the size of the spot. So we build this, uh, but unfortunately we were not the first one to finish it. Uh, in 2006, uh, uh, a scientist in uh, Germany finished it first. Uh, it was not possible because I arrived in 2004, they finished it in 2006. Uh, they have this spot, they created this donut, they overlap them. This is the effective spot size. It's spot size is was 66 nanometer. It's about four times better than 250 nanometer. And of course, they overcome the depression limit. Uh, but when I started this, uh, when we excite electron, we have two ways to excite electron uh, using one photon or using two photon. Okay. When I was thinking this experiment in 2004, I was thinking a two photon excitation microscope instead of one photon. Here is a comparison of single photon excitation. This is an object. <laughs> Should we do that? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a single photon excitation. You, you could see, we could see uh, basically, all the fluorophore were light up, but it was two photon excitation. We see uh, only where the laser beam is very intense, 
the 404 will be excited, right? So this I what, what I was thinking, but we were not the first one to finish it. Uh, but this is the setup that that you can see. Let's hit the X. Hit the X. So for step, we need two lasers, uh, one for excitation, the other one to create the donut. The donut needs a yellow beam, so we convert this uh, 800 nanometer laser to a 580 nanometer laser beam, and we overlap them. We overlap them, and we put it into the sample. Uh, in our approach, we scan the sample. Instead of scanning the laser beam, they both work. Uh, and this is a calculated donut in X, Y, and in Z. Uh, you can clearly see the resolution will be improved in X, Y, but because the donut is actually a cone, there's no improvement in Z. Okay, because Z, see, this is uh, Z is the same. So one disadvantage disadvantage of that is the X Y resolution is better, but Z stays the same, five hundred nanometer. Okay. Uh, this is actually the donut we created in our lab. You see the green piece as the donut. The, the red one is the excitation. This is X Y. X, Z, and Y, Z. So basically, we have a cylinder uh, in close excitation and deplete the forces from the outer portion of the, the beam. Uh, and this is, this was the result. This is a regular microscope. Uh, this is Kevioli. Uh, Rob will tell you Kevioli uh, later. Uh, Rob will tell us uh, Kevioli is a membrane protein. I already know that's Robert's job. He will explain to you. Uh, so this is a regular microscope without the donut, with the donut. So this is the area, and here's the area. You can see there are two vesicles here, but under regular microscope, we would think this is one vesicle, but actually two. We got a resolution about 55 nanometers. <laughs> And if you are interested, uh, we wrote a review uh, last year. Uh, this is the cover, so this is a regular conventional microscope. Uh, and then with step, we could see things about five times better. So this is step microscopy. Okay. The advantage of step microscopy is because it's, uh, even though the resolution is only five times better, but because this is a laser scanning microscopy, uh, it can look at live cells. It takes about 10, 15, 10 seconds to get an image, but the techniques allow us to look at live cell. Okay, the movie that uh, Robert just showed, we basically can redo them using these new tools uh, with better resolution. A different approach uh, to get uh, better resolution is this. This is something called stone or palm. Uh, I'm not going to explain the name, but here is the problem. If I have just one protein here, even the protein is a few nanometer, if I use a camera to take a picture, it's going to have a spot of 250 nanometer. That's the diffraction limit. But if I know there's only one protein here, when I look at this image, I know there's only one protein here. Where do you think the protein is located? It's the center of the spot. Right. I would think, I would guess the protein is here, not here. It should be here. So the whole point of this uh, technique is, if I can line up these force and die molecule one by one, 
I can locate them one by one. I can locate them with 10 nanometer resolution. Okay. So, this is the image, and I know there's only one molecule. I can put one spot. I need to be careful because if uh, if there are two molecules, they will not work, right? So the technique is that I just plot one molecule by one molecule, and if I have enough molecule, I will see the count, right? That was the idea. People have been trying this for many years, but in the same year, 2006, people succeeded. This was the first image published in 2006. Again, these are membrane protein. These are membrane protein on cell, uh, on the cell membrane. Uh, this is a regular microscope. And this is the image taken using this something we call single molecule approach. Okay. We locate molecule by molecule and put this dot, dot by dot, into this uh, reconstructed, we call it reconstructed images. These are not real images. These are reconstructed images. Okay. And resolution was good. 10 nanometer in X, Y, Z. Z may be 20. Okay. This is something people have never seen before. Okay. But because I have to image the molecule one by one, this image took 12 hours to produce. <laughs> Something rubber may not like, but it we really take twelve hours to get one image. <laughs> yeah. Also, the technique we have to be careful. If I have two molecules appear in the same place, because their distance is within two hundred fifty nanometer, it will appear as one single dot on my camera. I will think there's only one molecule. So this approach, we have to be very careful. I can only line up one molecule at a time within 250 nanometers. Okay. If not, I will think two molecules one. Okay. So then the whole trick is how can I line up molecule one by one? So there are different approach. People have used dye molecule after now six years of development. Uh, Actually, many molecules blink. Okay, when we put intense laser light or cert under certain condition, they actually blink very well. Okay, and I will show you a movie later. This is the microscope we built at UBC. It doesn't look like a microscope anymore, uh, but I want to point out objective lens here is always necessary. <laughs> we cannot build objective lens. So this one cost me ten thousand dollars just for this piece of objective. The other stuff actually not so expensive. Uh, the camera is expensive. Uh, so basically, we have objective lens sample. We put sample here, uh, and then we collect the image using two camera. Uh, two camera was needed because uh, we need uh, image two color. I'm going to show you a cell that Robert gave us. Uh, these are cavioli. Uh, Robert will explain. Uh, uh, Robert will tell us what those dots is. Uh, so this is a cell. Okay. And these are fluorescent dye uh, in there. So they are bright. Okay. The dye is attached to antibody. Antibody attached to the protein. Uh, this is a resolution that we will get using a traditional microscope. Now if I line up the molecule one by one, this is what I see. Each blink is one molecule. Okay. And we take this movie, uh, we teach computer how to read this image. So basically we cannot use pencil to plot these images. 
computer has to do it for us. Uh, so each dot, we try to have computer identify where is the peak center, and then put a dot on the image. Okay. Typically, for a, a sample like a rubber sample, we need several minutes to take the image. It's not 12 hours anymore. Uh, I have taken the image in 10 seconds, depending on how many molecules they blink. Okay. Actually, uh, for human eyes, we don't need that many points to recognize the pattern. Okay. Question? Uh, yes? Is this a real-time scan that we're seeing right now? This is close. I took the data at 50 frames per second. But when I convert the movie, uh, there's only option of 30 frames per second. Because 30 frames per second is <coughs> also video view. So this is slightly slower than real time. Uh, you could see most of them just appear for like 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, and then disappear. Some of them appear for like half a second. Okay, It doesn't matter. As long as I, as I make sure no two blink get too close, then I'm fine. this into computer, uh, computer will give me this image. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You see the dot are much smaller now. If I compare them side by side, this was the image we could really get using the most expensive microscope. And this was the image that taken using the microscope we built at UBC. Uh, the version is roughly 15 nanometers. Okay. And if I zoom in this area, compare side by side, uh, you could see this area. <coughs> There are three dots. Okay. Uh, so it's quite amazing uh, what this is a single molecule uh, spectroscopy can do. Okay, I think that's the robber will tell us what we can do with this uh, super resolution microscopy. Uh, Robert will tell us in biology. <coughs> Look into those spots, right? Look at those spots. Those are single spots of caviolin labeled protein. Caviolin labels structures that are called cavioli. Okay, so the name, the name, the name of the protein came from the name of the structure. And this is a caviolai by electron microscopy. Okay. And you look here, 0.01 micron, 0.01 micron. Is 10 nanometers, so this distance is 10 nanometers. I guess we can get maybe five or six of those across here. So we're looking at a structure that's 50 to 60, maybe 80 nanometers, depending on which one. So we're looking now at a, by EM, yeah, it's easy, by uh, super resolution, not so hard, but we're getting, oh sorry, we're getting down there and we're getting to the point where by fluorescence microscopy we're actually able to image structures that we could never see before. And so these are, again, some more cavioli. These are these nice invaginations. Uh, here's some more cavioli. Where we're cutting, they're, they're on the plasma membrane and they're sticking down and we're cutting like this. So we see a whole field of these cavioli. So they're opening up into the screen. So the, 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 the openings here are, are actually out of the screen. And you can again see this is 0.1 micron, 100 nanometers. It's probably bigger than most of these structures. Again, we're looking at structures that are, that are about, I don't know, 50 to 80 nanometers in diameter. Cavioli are found in endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are structures that surround blood vessels. Here is a capillary. Here's the lumen of the capillary. That's where the blood is. So blood is going to the capillary, the blood is going to the capillary, and for a long time, people 
Original early studies in the 50s identified these cavioli, smooth plasma level vesicles, and they saw them in endothelial cells, and they thought, oh, these structures, look at them. They're invaginating, they're budding, they must be transporting uh, the, the, essentially the oxygen via car protein carriers across this endothelial cell into the endomine uh, connective tissue, the basement membrane, into this cell, which is a muscle cell. And you can see here, these are the, the, all these little dots here, that's the actin. Muscle cells are contracting, they need lots of energy, actin, myosin, they're going back and forth. The energy comes from the mitochondria. Mitochondria generates ATP. Mitochondria need oxygen. Oxygen comes from the blood, has to put the oxygen from the blood, has to get across this layer. But the reality is, right now, we, 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 don't, we know, this is, a, again, it's a snapshot. Recent studies suggest that cavioli aren't that important in, in transport across the, 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 the endothelial cell. Uh, and, but the reality is, like Ken showed, we can't see cavioli by fluorescence microscopy. All we see are spots that are labeled by this protein cavioli. Okay, so there's a nice cavioli. We're seeing a bunch of spots in the reality. We don't even know if all those spots are cavioli. We don't know if all the cavioli in this image is really just around here. We don't, we don't know. We, we can't localize the protein. We can't define uh, which of these spots are cavioli. And by electron microscopy, we can't really tell if there are other structures to which cavioli is localized. And so why do we really want to know also cavioli spots? OK, we've got a bunch of spots. Why is it important? to know if we really have spots that are cavioli? Well, there are a thousand research papers published on cavioli and cancer. Okay, and, and if you look here, this is a survival curve. This is the survival of breast cancer patients. And this is the survival, and this is years from diagnosis. So here is five years, okay? We always talk about a five-year survival for cancer patients. And you can see that for patients whose cancers are negative for cavioli, called CAV1, okay. their survival rate is quite, it, it's certainly better than the survival rate of patients whose breast cancers are positive for CAV1. And so, and this is a very, very significant view. This was done with a collaborator at St. Paul's and at Sam Wiseman. And so CAV1, and this is not just, this is our work, but it's been done for a number of cancers. It's been done originally for prostate cancer, and it's found that cavioli 1 is a really poor prognosticator for some cancers. For other cancers, it's not so bad. And I think we don't really know. All these papers have been studying cavioli, but we don't really know what the role of cavioli, the beautiful structures I showed you, are in terms of cancer progression. And so cancer patients die because of cancer metastasis. Metastasis is the most devastating aspect of glioplastic disease. Metastasis is the process by which cells from a primary tumor migrate through the extracellular matrix, penetrate the bloodstream, and colonize distant sites. So we all know about metastasis, how terrible it is. Reality is without metastasis, cancer can be cured. A surgeon can easily go in, remove a primary tumor, and, we, and, 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 and the tumor is gone. Okay, so for cells to migrate, to metastasize, they have to migrate. And here are much of cells moving. These are cancer cells moving, not neutrophils like I showed you before, but the basic process is the same. They extend a protrusion, okay, and a pseudopod, a false or fake foot, okay, and these and they fall. Protrusion, the cell falls, the protrusion, the cell falls, you can see it here. For cells to protrude, they have a protrusion that's formed. This protrusion will then adhere through adhesions. I'm going to show you some adhesion soon. And then there'll be traction, whereby the cell moves forward. And then a really important step is uh, de adhesion, or to allow the tail to retract, and the cell can move forward. The cell starts here, it goes there. So it's really important that the cell forms protrusion and that it can detach from the back of the cell. It's like if you're climbing a ladder, it's really good if your hands go up the ladder, but if your feet are stuck on the same rung, you're not going to go very far up, so your feet have to move as well. Same thing for the cell has to protrude in the front and retract in the rear. And so these are, uh, these are adhesions, these little spots. Those are sites where the cell is actually adhering to the substrate. And this is a, this is a cancer cell, but this is a cancer cell that's not expressing cavioli. And you can see the <coughs> this is a, a movie over about, it's recycled over and over, but it's about 30 minutes 
when we're watching the cell over about 30 minutes, and you can see the cell is moving a little bit, but not really too much. You can see some protrusions here, and the adhesions are pretty static. If now we take that same cell and we add caviolin, all of a sudden you can see that there are uh, adhesions that are detaching at the rear of the cell, and you can see the formation here of new adhesions and a protrusion, and this cell is really migrating faster. We can measure the migration, and we can see that the migration is happening more faster. So caviolin is promoting migration. But we don't really know if caviolin is promoting migration through cavioli. And we've done some work where we've shown that caviolin doesn't just form cavioli, but it also forms flat structures. And these structures we call cav1 scaffolds. And these are flat caviolin domains. And we know that there's another protein called cav1 or PTRF that's required to take cav1 from being flat to being a caviolin. So we're very interested in understanding, well, what's the contribution of these structures and these structures to cancer cells, cancer progression, and cancer migration? And so we want to go in by simply, we've done, oh, sir. I'm almost getting bogged down in Sorry. detail. So i just like to maybe raise it a level. Yeah. So caviolin is a protein that you're able to mark yeah. with this fluorescent dye. Yes. And then with the super resolution, microscope, you're able to image those little dye spots, so you so. get this uh, definition of the cell, and then you watch it move, and therefore you can say this cell moves better when so, it like doesn't I have you, I No, I, I, lo I lost you because, oh, hold yeah. on. Uh, oh, why is it going that way? <coughs> okay. So I, I, I didn't want to go into too much detail. I just wanted to show you a cell moving. And so here we're not looking at caviolin. This is a protein called focal adhesion kinase. It marks focal adhesions. These are adhesion sites, not caviolin. Oh. It's just to show adhesion sites to give you an idea that caviolin is not just these little structures like this. It's also affecting the behavior of these adhesions. Okay, okay so the caviolin is, is obviously doing something else besides, oh, I don't know, some sort of internalization or, or, or other process, it's regulating the behavior of these adhesions. And okay. the behavior of these adhesions is affecting how a cell migrates. And so we, if we put caviolin in here, we're seeing changes in the way these adhesions behave. Well, is that the cavioli that's doing that? Or are there other caviolin positive structures that are, so we want to know, what we want to know is, what's the contribution of caviolin here and is that through cavioli, or is it through other structures? And it may, it may very well be that having lots of cavioli is good for your cancer, but having lots of structures that drive the, 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 the turnover of these adhesions is very bad. But we can't really distinguish them. So that's why we need super resolution microscopy. Okay. So we want to know if we can, maybe these structures are driving migration, and these structures are driving, uh, protecting uh, or, or preventing a cancer progression, which is called, called a tumor suppressor. And we want to figure out, we want to really go into our cancers and say, which one of these structures is expressed in cancers that have caviolin? And so, so here we're using an antibody with the dye. And this is STED, this is a STED microscope, not one that Ken built. This is one that's actually being sold by Leica, who sponsored this talk, okay? And, and they were very generous to us. And they allowed us to go into, use their microscope and generate this data. And what we saw was that, oh, we can get better resolution. Really hard to see here. Okay, a lot, bunch of spots. And these are cells that have cavioli. We know from the electron microscopy, we can say these cells have cavioli and these cells don't. And they all have a bunch of spots, a little bit different organization. And if we go here, you can actually see that we're getting, uh, better resolution, okay? So you can see, just like Kang showed you, not as nice as Kang, Kang has much better, better, nicer images, but we can certainly see the spots are a bit fuzzier here, and they're better here. You can again see down here, a little cluster here, one, two, three, four, five, six, I don't know, maybe two spots here. So we can get better resolution. We get, we go with, from, from standard confocal to stead microscopy from about 200 spots to almost 700 spots, we're getting better resolution. And when we actually went in and measured the size of the spots in the cells without caviolin, we got 127 nanometer average size. Okay. But we went and we looked at the cells with caviolin, we got a 313. So we think 
that what's happening when you don't have caviola, then you have another structure, and this is a structure that we call a cavern scalpel that's smaller. And we want to really know which cells express these structures. But we're again, and so we, we're, we're going gonna, gonna to, we're in the problem, we just received a grant, we're going to be able to buy one of these microscopes. So this is a million dollar microscope, just to go from 100, let's give you an idea of cost. So we're going from a standard microscope that Ken was showing is 100,000. If we want to buy a STEM microscope from a company, it's going to cost us a million dollars. So this is all, uh, it's, it's, but it's quite expensive and it's, uh, it's really high technology. We then went and used uh, storm uh, particle localization, okay, a little bit to do the same thing. And this was done with, uh, again, by, we don't have a microscope here yet, this is again by a commercial microscope that again we hope to be able to purchase. Uh, and here we went, it, again, we took what we can do now, look at cells with cavioli, and you can see these big spots, okay, and these spots. And when we went to the cell without cavioli, you can see how much smaller they are, and how, how, how more homogeneous they are. They're all pretty much the same size. And so this is very, this, this suggests that we do have two different structures in uh, these cells. One, which are larger, which we presume are cavioli, and one which are smaller. And to really know if the cavioli, we want to be able to image them not just in this 2D dimension, we want to get some 3D information. And that's what we can do, and Ken didn't really talk to you about that, but we can get 3D information out of these spots because they can put a convex lens in, and this lens will change the shape of the spots. So all the spots that Ken was showing you around, but if it's a little bit out of the focal plane it'll, with this lens, it'll change the shape, and that shape will give information on the height. And by using that approach, we were able to really go into these cells, once with cavioli, and to really see this really beautiful, we were really thrilled when we saw this, to see this, and that looks very much like a cavioli. And so we can actually get some 3D information, and they're, they're not, these guys are still pretty high, and I think that's just because our resolution isn't that great. Okay, so we got this little, but we can certainly see that the structures in the cells with cavioli are taller than the structures of the cells without cavioli. So we're very interested to be able to go in and to see whether or not we can go into cells and see, do cells only have cavioli or do they have a mix of these structures? And do different cells that are, have different metastatic ability express these different structures with different shapes and different sizes? Okay, in this particular case, uh, what makes them without cavioli? This is just cells that we have generated. And these are cells that you've actually worked with but the cells that, 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 that just don't have any cavioli. The reason they don't have cavioli is probably because they don't have that protein PTRF cavin 1. And so if they don't have PTRF cavin 1, they won't make cavioli. And there are a number of cancer cells that have caviolin, but don't have this protein called PTRF or cavin 1. And so all they have are ours. They must, they must have these structures that are scaffolds. And so we think that they must contribute in some way to cancer progression. So what we would like to do is use super-resolution microscopy to define the cavioline domains that are expressed in cancer cells and that contribute to metastasis and to the poor survival of cancer patients whose cancers express cavioline. And so that's one project, okay? But I can tell you there are lots of projects in cellology which would benefit from super-resolution microscopy. And I think our real goal is to take uh, the, the to, to go and take all the all the all the wonderful work that's been done, I would say since not want to say since, well, since 400 years ago, but even more so since 1940s or so, when they discovered electron microscopy and the field of cellology really started to go down and apply optical techniques to see even even in more detail into the cell. And so, just to tell you, we we, we Ken and I and a, a, a number of other investigators at UBC applied for a grant, uh, based in large part on this work that we're doing, which, which is quite, it, it, I wouldn't say we're the first, but we're certainly in the avant-garde of the super-resolution field, and we were able to get funds from this, uh, uh, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the CFI, to purchase uh, super-resolution microscopes. And so uh, we're going to buy this STEM microscope from Leica. Kang is going to build a two-photon that microscope, and we're also going to buy another super resolution modality, and so hopefully we're going to be able to apply, not just for us, but for lots of other labs and lots of other projects, super resolution microscopy to uh, the, a number of biological processes. So we have a lot here, we have all sorts of different, you can see the number of researchers for, for cancer, for diabetes, 
but, uh, and, and, and for a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, so we're involved in this. And so uh, I think that's where we're going to end, and we're, we're more than happy to take questions. And, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.